Hi, this is Terry Glaze, and you're listening to Drag the Waters. With Joshua. All right, guys, it is now time to drag the waters some more here on the CMSPN, the CMS Podcast Network. And we have the one, the only Heidi Shepherd of Butcher Babies. Heidi, how are you today? <laughs> I'm good. Thank you so much. It's uh I would say, hey, it's finally 2021, but it's still <laughs> it's still a giant disaster. <laughs> yeah, yeah. You know, you know, all this uh global unrest, and here we are talking about Pantera. So hey, I guess it kind of makes sense. <laughs> <laughs> That's how I cope with things. I just I just you know, go back to what makes you comfortable and then and Pantera is like a nice warm bowl of mashed potatoes or something yes it's all the feel goods <laughs> uh so let's kind of talk about i mean obviously you know you guys have been off the road for a while you've been at home um you have put out a couple of singles last month you got sleeping with the enemy and uh bottom of a bottle over the last few months you know so so what's been going on with you what's up well we were sitting on these songs for quite a while so we're really excited to finally get these out into the public um actually we've been sitting on them since uh summer of 2019 and of course we had all these big plans for 2020 releasing songs periodically throughout the year while we're on tour of course but when all that took a you know a turn for the worst we just kind of put everything on the back burner and um I think most of the music industry did and it came to a point where we all felt like, oh, we have to get this out there. <laughs> if I don't get some music out there, I'm going to feel like a giant piece of shit. So <laughs> so we just, we started releasing songs. And I'm so glad we did because I feel like it was perfect timing. Everyone needs a little bit something uh, new in their lives since we've been sitting staring at the same four walls. <laughs> so uh, yeah, just releasing music. We have more music coming out all the way through 2021. And then we're going to uh, record again uh, in February. So I'm really excited about that. Yeah, I think a lot of people are going to end up 2021 or 2022, whenever the world kind of comes back, you know, right. you know, get an onslaught of of new music and new tours. And I, I think we're going to have to have like five or six you know, Ozfest all at once, just traveling because everyone needs to tour. Well, that and I, you know, I think about the first moment that I'm going to stand on stage, and that makes me emotional right. because it's been so long. I mean, we took time off in 2019 to record, to write and record, and so it's been it's been a very long time for us. We only played two shows in 2019, so. Wow. I'm like, I'm all cobwebs right now. <laughs> and we were supposed to do a live stream in December, but uh, it, it, someone on our team tested positive for COVID. So we had to postpone that as well. So I'm just like, I'm just over here sipping my tea. There you go. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. It's, it's, it's nuts, you know, looking to talk to you, you know, one of the big things in the Butcher Baby's career was uh, a cover of Fucking Hostile that went viral forever ago on YouTube. And so yeah. I went back down the rabbit hole and watching YouTube videos from ever ago uh, of live shows. And I'm like, oh, man, I totally I, I almost forget what being in a live show is uh, like anymore. I know. And who knows if it'll come back the same. I mean, I hope so. I think when we're all allowed to go and people feel comfortable it's gonna be i'll, I'll be at a show every night right. <laughs> you know besides playing it i'll i want to i want to go to a show every night i miss it i miss that feeling just as much as everyone else you know so uh, i hope it comes back the same just fingers crossed <laughs> so what have you been doing this, this last year you know just kind of are you sitting around staring at a wall? Or are you writing new music? I mean, you talked a little bit about that, but I mean, what's what's the day to day life of Heidi these days? Oh well, <laughs> I wake up, look at the wall. No, I we've been writing music. We've been doing a lot of different um, artistic things, uh, different experimenting with different sounds, trying different covers, a lot of stuff that has been unreleased, and uh, like I said, we're going into the studio in February to record. And that's going to be great because we've been sitting on these songs that we've written for a really long time as well. I, we just, we have so many 
so much material, so many songs to record. It's hard to narrow down which ones to actually do. So we're really, really excited about that aspect. This, the fact that we've had time to sit and do this. I also moved. I lived in Los Angeles for about 15 years and I moved to Las Vegas. I never thought I would ever live in Las Vegas, <laughs> but here I am. And I actually really like it. I look out my window and I've got the side of a mountain. It's really peaceful here. You wouldn't think Las Vegas would be peaceful, but it's very peaceful. We we, we flew out there a couple of years ago for my birthday. And it was it was funny. You're like flying in. You're like, there's nothing, nothing, nothing. And then boom, city. You know, like you're, you're yeah. right in the middle of nowhere. Oh, absolutely. And something I really love about it is because there's the strip, of course, you know, Party Central there, which I've only been to once since I've lived here. And I moved here in August. But on the outskirts, it's all really peaceful and beautiful. Deserts, I love it. It's 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 beautiful here. Never thought that I would live here. <laughs> yeah, I mean, it's definitely a great town. I played there a few times, and then obviously did the birthday there and stuff. And I actually got my, uh, you know, I've, I've been there many times, put it that way. And it's 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 a uh, definitely a fun town. Got a lot of great friends out there. Chris Kale, you know, all those guys out yeah. there. Yeah. So you know, definitely a lot of good friends in Vegas. So uh, you know, definitely need to get out there more often. Yeah, you know, that's something I realized, too. Uh, so most of my friends had moved out of Los Angeles, including Carla, the, my, my, the other girl in my band. <laughs> uh, Carla moved to Chicago, and uh, our drummer moved to Oregon. And so Henry and I were like, well, there's really nothing here for us anymore because all of our friends are moving. Yeah. And so we came to Vegas and we have more friends and more things to do <laughs> than we, I, feel, I feel like I ever had in LA. <laughs> yeah, definitely. Uh, it's, it's over the last few years, there's definitely been a, you know, convergence of, of metal dudes just all moving to Vegas, you know, so mm -hmm. definitely, yeah. definitely going to have a lot of people around. Um, Kind of going back on your history, and I and I know you you were on the Talk to Me podcast forever ago, and we kind of went over this a little bit. But uh, you know, just going into you, you know, growing up around the house was was your house full of music? You know, were your parents musical? Where how how did that go? Yes, they were very musical. In fact, it was funny. I fell down the rabbit hole of old photos last night, and I was showing Henry uh, pictures of my family playing uh instruments just uh, my family get where they get together they would pull out the drums pull out the guitars my dad is the middle of 12 kids and so they had a they had a giant <laughs> family and they would play music together all the time it was like a family band and so every time they get together there's music uh people are singing so i was showing henry pictures of my grandpa who has since passed away but uh you know, sitting around singing, playing guitar with the kids. That's what I grew up around. But it wasn't heavy music at all. I, in fact, wasn't allowed to listen to anything heavy. Right. Um, it was all old time, old timey type stuff. And uh, the things that my parents listened to was like Air Supply <laughs> or Sticks. <laughs> and so, or the Osmonds, which I grew up on. And so, uh, for, you know, for me, that was my musical upbringing and I loved it. It was so much fun. In fact, everyone else in my family, I'm the oldest of six kids. Everyone else in my family plays an instrument except for me, but I am a vocalist. So right. I guess that's kind of an instrument. <laughs> yeah. But, yeah. Unfortunately, my, my grandmother passed away recently and we went to the funeral oh. and they had all these old photos of the family and the old photos of my dad and his brothers and sisters looked like they could have been in like a 1970s traveling in a van or traveling in a school bus kind of, kind of, oh, yeah. you know, it's so great to see those old photos. I love it's so cute. Photos. Yeah. Yeah. It was, it's so cute. It was just like uh, almost just a trip down memory lane because I'm one of the oldest cousins. And so I was there for a lot of that. And I knew all of the songs my grandpa would sing. And my, my dad always would play his guitar and kick his legs. And he was just so, it was so cool. <laughs> oh, that's definitely the coolest. Man. So, so when were you introduced to heavy music, not being able to listen to it growing up? So, like most metalheads, I was a rebellious child. I was an athlete, and so uh, I ran track and field, and I was a cheerleader, and I I would go running throughout my neighborhood. Well, just outside my neighborhood was a skate park, <laughs> and I would run to the skate park and hang out with all the kids. And that's the first time that I heard metal. 
And it was something that I just immediately gravitated towards. Um, I remember the first time that I heard of Slipknot, um, what was a kid was wearing a Slipknot shirt and I looked at it and it was almost like <laughs> terrifying. I'm like, what is this? What is going on here? What are these clowns? <laughs> you know? And, uh, and, and I had to know what it was. And then as the music, uh, they blast their boom boxes, uh, and skate. And then uh, a couple of the kids had a band. I think they were called like Pandora or something like that. <laughs> and, um, I would tell my mom, I'm going to hang out with other friends and I'd go and see their band play, or I'd hang out at the skate park and see the, mu- you know, hear the music. And, and it was really something that grabbed, like grabbed me from the inside, I guess you can say it was the music that described how I was feeling as an adolescent, uh, sheltered teenager. And, um, I remember, and I, I've told this story so many times, I don't remember if I told you this, but I remember my mom found a corn CD in my closet and she pulled it up, broke it in front of my face. And she's like, you don't, you don't have this stuff in my house. <laughs> my mom loves corn now, but <laughs> <laughs> back in the day, it's funny because all of our parents and butcher babies, they're all super, they're super into metal now. Very, very uh, supportive now. But back then, she was not having it. I, I remember when I when there's still people in my my hometown that I grew up in that um, think that I'm a devil worshiper. <laughs> they just they think that uh, uh, there was a, a neighbor who told my brother, whom was moving out to L.A. to live with me at the time. My neighbor told my brother, "Now don't go living in L.A. and end up like your sister, <laughs> as if like I'm some horrible human being." It's because of metal. No, oh, it is. It, it, <laughs> it, it, it's funny kind of thinking back to to listening to Slipknot. Obviously, you know, I grew up listening to Kiss and then Metallica and Megadeth. Mm-hmm. So, you know, there's a gradual of increase to Slipknot. I don't know what my brain would have done had been like that been my introduction to metal. <laughs> Your Iowa or, or the self-titled, you know. Well, I think one of the first songs was Surfacing. And, you know, fuck this world, fuck everything that you stand for. And that was, I was all (gasps) clutching my pearls. (laughs) Oh my God. I love this. (laughs) So, I mean, like I said, it was definitely speaking to what I was feeling inside. I grew up Mormon and I felt so sheltered in this, in Provo, Utah, where I, I remember, cause I was a cheerleader and I would wear tank tops you know, not, not, not just in my uniform, but I mean, like at school and all the other cheerleaders are like, she's such a hoe (laughs) because I wore tank tops. And if I used the F word, I was just, you know, such a bad person. So it just, it, it, it was my escapism, I guess you could say. And this kind of leads into the, the podcast subject, you know, when was the first time you remember hearing Pantera? Oh my God. Well, Pantera, that's why I think the band name was Pandora because they would blast Pantera all the time. <clears throat> and I think that was their biggest influence, the, the, the band that I would go see. And uh, I th- yeah, really think it was Pandora is what they called themselves. But it was, um, that was the first time uh, at the skate park was hearing Pantera. And to me, Pantera was a because I, I was introduced to like Slipknot and that first, but Pantera for me was more of that groovy type. Uh, I guess more of it hit a little bit harder, just a little bit more like this rather than this. <laughs> <laughs> so that that was I, I I obviously really loved it. Pantera has had a huge um, influence on my life as uh, a, you know a heavy metal vocalist i mean phil was one of my biggest idols i've toured with him since and it's that was the most incredible thing <laughs> did you ever get to see them live i'm, I'm trying to put the timeline together that probably would have been right no, anything up i didn't because like you know i wasn't allowed to and they were done before i graduated from high school right so yeah that was <laughs> That's the biggest bummer of my life, I feel like. <laughs> right. 
Yeah, but I did get to see Vinny play, and I did get to see Phil play, and I have seen Rex play. So other than that, but no, I mean, it, it, it's so unfortunate. But of course, I've watched videos, and I feel like I have adopted, I guess you can say, a lot of the stage moves and the, I guess, the party a- aspect of Pantera. Like, they take their music seriously, but on stage it's a fucking party. <laughs> and I remember watching videos of them and that was my inspiration. Um, if you've ever seen Butcher Babies, I, we don't stand still. Like not one person on stage is standing still, right. <laughs> even the drummer. <laughs> so, <laughs> so it's, it's, you know, we, we've definitely taken a, a, a page out of their book for our live show. I can't help it. I, ha- I like, I get on stage and I just feel it. It just happens. Yeah. Growing up. I mean, when you're watching vulgar video or, or any, just any of the videos growing up, that makes you want to be in a band. Like you're like, Oh yeah. I want to be dime bag Daryl. I want to have fun. I want to drink alcohol at uh, large quantities and just party, but also just be masters at your craft too. So yeah, it's, it's definitely a, a guidebook to how to how to be a rock star. Absolutely. And I, I am super grateful for that. And it's, it, I, people have said I'm like the heavy metal cheerleader because I just like jump <laughs> around and cr- just crazy on stage. And, and that's how Phil was. And, you know, him just jumping everywhere, couldn't give a shit. And I just, I, I gravitate towards that so hard. <laughs> I'm so bummed. I never got to see them play, but I'm grateful for the videos. So when did you tour with Phil? What was what was that tour? Uh, it was the uh, Revolver Golden God tour. Um, okay. It was Black Label Society down Devil You Know and Butcher Babies. Okay. And um, it was absolutely incredible. I would probably watch them every single night. <laughs> um, now, Phil, I, this is the craziest the coolest, craziest story. He was so sweet to us. Just the nicest guy. Um, we all got along so well. I of course was like <laughs> nervous to even talk to him, but he was just so down to earth, such a cool dude. And, um, <laughs> he, they had, they, they, they weren't there for like the last five shows or something like that. And it was the last show that we were playing with them. And Phil, we, he was saying bye to everybody and he came up to me and he says, I bestow upon you the gift of success. <laughs> and he turns around and walks away. Like it's a fucking movie, right? <laughs> he turns around and walks away and he, t- he turns back and he looks at me and he's like, actually it's a curse. Yeah. And keeps walking. And I but like, <laughs> 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 it's like being knighted or like, right. like Jesus Christ himself put his crown. <laughs> you know, it's just kind of like, it was, it was pretty amazing. And, and I, I always remember that because it was just such a cool moment where one of your idols is just so cool. Cause I've met other idols that were not cool, right. but he was just so cool. And on stage, he just demands such control and he has a presence about him, um, you know, to this day. And even when he walks in a room, and I just find that so inspiring. And how cool he was to everyone, being the legend that he is, that's also something that was very inspiring too. Yeah, I mean, the last time I saw him was at a uh, uh, media tent, you know, at a festival. Yeah. You know, obviously he walks into the media tent and it doesn't matter who you're interviewing, everybody just, you know, turned to him. But he stopped, talked to everybody, took pictures with everybody, signed everything, just, Mm -hmm. you know, had little side conversations with almost everybody. Like he could have absolutely, he he doesn't need to go into the media tent, but he came in, talked to everybody, told us what's going on. And then, you know, it's, it's a, it's a great, great to see him kind of in that uh, atmosphere. Oh yeah. I hope, I hope someday I get to tour with him again. I mean, he's just such a, he's such a doll. (laughs) And I remember we played Rocklahoma right after that tour and he was side stage watching us. And I was like, well, shit, better, better do good. <laughs> <laughs> but yeah, I, I, I adore him. And Vinny was just like the sweetest, nicest guy. I absolutely incredible. Every time we came to Vegas and he was in town, he would come see us play. And he, 
he, actually, it was, I think the last time I saw him was about three days before he passed. Uh, we were playing here in Vegas and he was at the show and it was always just the nicest guy, the nicest guy. So, I mean, the Pantera family in my eyes is, it, it's like a staple of how to treat other people, I oh. guess you can say, you know, in this music industry, it's so easy for, you know, musicians and vocalists, everyone to get a big head or whatever, you know, and these guys don't and didn't. And so for me, um, that's definitely a huge inspiration. Kind of before we dive into that, the reading a lot of stuff over the last day or so about you guys and coming up. And the one thing that kind of did kept, kept coming up through the, everything was the fucking hostile YouTube clip from about 10 years ago. (laughs) And and it's like it was in every little bio or little little sheet was, you know, who who at the first claim to fame was a viral video of fucking hostile. So, so just kind of go over like that video kind of going viral. And people, <laughs> you know, hearing the yeah. band play and just being like, you know, girls playing Pantera. That's amazing. You know, well, I received more death threats in my life than I have ever received again. <laughs> um, so. When we first started, we were just, like, having fun. And um, that video was from, I think it was 2010. And we were playing a NAMM party for Schechter Guitars. And before we'd gone on stage, they blew the the PA. Like, it was completely, like, we we, didn't know if we were actually going to be able to play. But uh, it was just a small, shitty bar. And which we usually played and we loved. It was yeah. fun. Um, and we got up there and did our cover of fucking hostile and someone's, you know, old ass flip phone. <laughs> caught it. Yeah. yeah. Their old ass flip phone caught it and uh, put it online. And that shit still haunts me to this day. Um, I loved covering that song. In fact, You know, something very interesting is Carla and I, when we first started Butcher Babies, um, we had a different guitar player than we had, than we have now. And, um, we said, Hey, we want to cover fucking hostile. And he was like, yeah, right. I can't play that. That's too fast. He's, he's in some like trash Hollywood band now. I don't know. And he, he's like, I can't play that. You guys that you're crazy. And, uh, so we got a different guitar player and he could play it just fine. <laughs> he's just, he's all, Oh, fucking hell. So sharp. You know? <laughs> and, um, we actually, we've covered it a couple of times since then. We covered it last January at Dime Bash again. And it was, just, it's just so much fun. I love that song. It's just so like, fuck you. <laughs> yeah. But, but that video, I mean, People share it as if that's who we are today. I, you know, we were just young kids having fun and got to play some sort of fun show. Yeah. And but it did it it did spike a lot of I guess controversy in a way. You know, Revolver magazine um, they I think they're the ones who printed about it first. Some I was at the House of Blues in L.A. Rest in peace and. <laughs> some some kid came up to me and he was like look it's you guys can you sign my magazine it was like this little blurb on the bottom of a page and and I had no idea that it was there so I signed it and um, that was just I guess that was our first publication and that was cool so in a way I'm grateful for it but I hate that it's still around (laughs) (laughs) I'm sure you also went and bought 20 copies of that publication too you know you're like Oh, oh my yeah, God, magazine. You know, you signed that, and then you ran to Barnes and Nobles and <laughs> cleared out the shelf. Oh, absolutely! <laughs> I think I went to like three different magazine stands to find it. There was a magazine stand that was by my house at the time in Hollywood, and I, every time we were in Revolver or Metal Hammer or any of those, I'd go to that magazine stand, and the guy there, he he knew because I would be like, "Look, I'm in this. That's me." <laughs> And so I'd walk in. He's like, all right, what are you in this time? <laughs> so, I, you know, it, I, I guess it did spark kind of, a, you know, a revolution for Butcher Babies. But um, 
but I also got a lot of death threats. Well, yeah, like, I was going to ask you, what were the death threats? What were, what were the basis of the death threats? Oh my God, you ruined, how dare you? <laughs> this is, this is sacrilegious. Uh, you ruined my favorite song, uh, which I mean, it, it sound that that video sounds fucking terrible but like yeah <laughs> you've ruined my favorite song uh how dare you even try and touch pantera if you ever come to tennessee you better blah 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 you know all this kind of shit and you know i i was always just like a kid that wanted to play music and uh you know I, i'm like oh fuck yeah our, our, this is the break, man. And then to have that kind of backlash right. from yeah. like metal heads and being like, well, she's a chick and she has boobs. So she doesn't, she, <laughs> she's fake. She's fake metal. What a poser. And I'm like, that's so crazy because this is what I escaped to as right. a kid. You know, I escaped to the metal from my, you know, the clutches of the Mormon um, society. And that's, that was my escapism. And then to have the same people, like threatening to kill me if I ever come to Tennessee. <laughs> like that was, that was, you know, at 20, how old was I? 24 when this happened, you know, at 24, I was just kind of like, Oh man, what do I do? Like, what a bummer, you know, right. it, you, you, you finally get your big break and everyone fucking hates you. Like that to me, that was just a big, Wow. It was an eye opener, but the thing is, is that I it, I developed really thick skin. Like, there's nothing someone could say to me that hasn't been said to me before. There's nothing someone could say about me that hasn't been said before. So I just don't like. I guess that's that. That was you know a good thing going right. into my thirties. I just don't give a <laughs> shit anymore. <laughs> I do what I want. <laughs> but that's the thing about you know women in metal is is like they'll post a picture of you. And you'll see in the comment section, like, did you know that her left nostril is bigger than her right nostril? You know, like, <gasps> you don't pick it that much, you know? Like, I don't know if that's true about your nostrils. But I'm just it might saying, be. Uh, <laughs> I'm just it, it's funny just how nitpicky they get about women in metal. But, like, you can, you know, dudes in metal dye their hair black and, and do everything else for the rest of their lives. Like, dude, still looks awesome. <laughs> <laughs> well, I mean, it's like, okay, for instance... We started releasing music and I, I was tagged in something on Instagram just the other day. Uh, this uh, Portuguese publication was like Playboy Bunnies, release new music, blah, blah, blah. <laughs> I was never a Playboy Bunny. Right. Not once have I ever done anything like that. Uh, Carla was never a Playboy Bunny. But for some reason, our entire career, that's what people ha have pushed it upon us like we've I, I've never done anything like that and like I worked for Playboy at the radio station for the morning show but I was never in the magazine I'm not a bunny never did anything like that so you know that's kind of interesting to me that people they assume right. stuff like that um but yeah I mean if it's like like uh, for me I I was born with a birth defect called gastroschisis and I don't have a belly button now I, that's my, I have a scar that's like this big. That's my battle wound. Like I fucking survived that. That was not something in 85 that kids survived from. And so <clears throat> I don't mind showing it off to me. It's been there my whole life. I've never had a belly button. I don't know what they feel like, you know, <laughs> but I have my, I have this scar and I will wear crop tops. I don't give a shit. And people will be like, Oh my God, she's had a tummy tuck. <laughs> or like, or like, oh, plastic surgery gone wrong. <laughs> just, uh, it's just you can't win with these idiots. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it's definitely a mess. It's definitely a mess. Oh. <laughs> but I, you know, I love it, so it's fine. <laughs> yeah, it's definitely it's definitely something. Um, you know, we were talking about you know, twenty twenty technically would have been ten years of the band. Twenty twenty one is going to be ten years of your first EP. Yes. It's, it's, so it's a pretty it's a pretty big uh, time, even though, you know, everything, even though the entire world is burning down around us, you know, it's a, it's a big time for the band. Yeah, it is. And it's crazy to even be sitting here and saying, oh, my gosh, we've been doing this for 10 years. It's gone by really fast. Uh, we we released a 10 year anniversary wine. Um, but to look back and think that we recorded, you know, Mr. Slow Death or Jesus Needs for Babies for His War Machine. 
um, 10 years ago. That's crazy to me. And listening to those recordings, um, and I'm sure, you know, every musician can uh, attest to this. You listen to those recordings, you're like, wow, it was so, I sound so different now. Like, I've progressed so much over the years. And that's, you know, that comes with experience, of course. But, um, yeah, it's wild. Like, so wild. Like, I can't believe that we're saying 10 years ago that was the first time (laughs) people heard our music. Back to the death threats. I was thinking the first time. (laughs) Sorry. My track of thought there for a second. But uh, the the funny thing was the first time I guess I saw you guys was in Nashville at uh, with Danzig. And so I'm, I'm assuming, you know, you rolled up to that show and you're like kind of looking around like, you know, where are these death threats coming from? Uh, yeah, th- we we had played Tennessee several times since, before that, <laughs> um, that tour with Danzig. Uh, the first time that we toured the Midwest, it was kind of a little bit like, uh, <sighs> do we hire security? Because, you know, we were a baby band, like not making any money, traveling in a converted airport shuttle van that didn't even have like air conditioning, barely had brakes, you know, and it's just. It was a little bit terrifying um, because you never know what people really will do, you know, and look at what happened with Dime. You know, <clears throat> we think about that all the time because um, you never know. And it is, it's still, it's, there's still stuff that goes on. I mean, we've had to, in Tennessee, we had to send um, a, a police department over to a dude's house because, he, we knew exactly who he was and he was, this was just last year and he was sending us death threats. And, um, so we had to, I, 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 getting a restraining order in another state is absolutely like almost impossible. Right. And so we just had to have the police go over there and tell them to knock it off, <laughs> you know, and, and this is not the, you know, <laughs> first, second, third, fourth, fifth time that shit like that has happened. And I, and I'm not the only one who's dealt with that. I mean, musicians at, at every level deal with that. Um, people at every level deal with that. Uh, but it is a little bit scary because every time you go out, you don't know who has a vendetta against you. You don't know who is sick or who in their wrong mind would do something. So you just never know. But, you know, we love what we do and you, I'll sacrifice everything to do it. It's, it's, it's my blood. And the fact that it hasn't been pumping through my veins in the past two years has been really hard. (laughs) Yeah, it's definitely a mess. Well, well, being from Tennessee, I'm not currently in Tennessee, but being from Tennessee, I would like to apologize for the state. (laughs) (laughs) No, I love Tennessee. I love Nashville. Nashville is one of my favorite cities. (laughs) So I, I, I love Tennessee. In fact, you know, before escaping from California, as I will say, um, that was on the list of places to possibly go. So (laughs) by all means, it's, it's nothing against the state. There's crazy people everywhere. (laughs) Absolutely. Um, you, you said you've seen Rex live. What did you see Rex do? What was he, what was he playing in at the time? I think he was in Kill Devil Hill. Um, but when we were on tour with down Rex came and played some Pantera songs with the mm-hmm. boys and down. And that was super fucking cool. Uh, we were there. Rita was there. Uh, we were all standing side stage, just watching. It was really cool. Um, I think Zach got up and played too. Just, uh, you know, I've, I haven't seen him since then. That was in, I think, 2014. I haven't seen him since then, but but that was that was where I've seen him play. I, I end with Kill Devil Hill, I think, at Nam or something. Okay. Yeah. Speaking of getting up and playing uh, classic songs, that that Danzig tour you got to do, was when Doyle would come out and do the Misfits set, and that blew my mind. I mean, that was obviously before the big Misfits reunions and all that stuff. So getting to see Danzig and Doyle even play like, I think they played like seven misfit songs in uh-huh. 12 minutes, but it was like, that was the entire reason to, to go to that door, you know? Absolutely. <laughs> that was so cool. That was so cool. And they treated us so well. Um, Danzig made sure that we 
had everything we needed. He, uh, we, in fact, Carla and I were so obsessed with this whole scenario that Doyle was there and finally touring with Danzig, um, huge inspiration for both of us. Uh, we used to cover <laughs> um, Mother back in the day. And so it was just so, it was so cool. We would stand side stage every night and we missed one night and Danzig asked where we were because <laughs> he was like, where are the girls? They're usually here. Um, I have never in all my years seen a place almost fall to the ground. Um, it was... Uh, <sighs> In El Paso, I think the place was called Tricky Falls. The pit was so crazy that the soundboard just migrated to the <laughs> to the back of the uh, <laughs> of yeah. the place. And and I remember Wedge was their sound guy. His name's Wedge, oh, yeah. and he's there trying to push the soundboards. You know, trying to <laughs> keep Look everything under right. control. Yeah, he's not he's not uh, he's not a large man. So yeah, I could definitely see him trying to hold everything together. It was wild and I loved it. And that tour was actually the first time we got booed. <laughs> I think it's the only time we've been booed um, <laughs> from, from like in the same room. I'm sure people at home are like, boo, <laughs> but <laughs> uh, it was in um, Niagara Falls and we were in the middle of our set and one got, there were these group of dudes who just decided they didn't want us there and they just started booing. And it was so loud. It was so fucking loud. And I looked down at them and it, it, it's such a powerful thing to be on stage and be like, this is my spot. Right. Like you don't, you don't come to my house and act like this. And so we did, we just turned the crowd against them. <laughs> so the crowd took care of it. I'm like, these guys over there, let's fuck them up. <laughs> right. But, um, but that tour was so cool. And to this day, I mean, um, if, like I, I went to uh, Danzig's Halloween party. Um, you know, he, he's, we're still friends. And it's, it's, I love building those relationships. And like um, Steve and, uh, you know, Doyle himself too. Just great people. Love the fact that Doyle would get the entire Doyle regalia on just to come out for those couple of songs, you know, but uh, I, I got to sit, do a sit down interview with him a few years ago and I couldn't do the interview with him until he was ready to go. And so I walk on their, their, uh, uh, you know, little tour van or whatever. And he's just, you know, already in all the garb, you know, no shirt, just muscles everywhere with the, you know, the white <laughs> the devil lock and the white face paint. I'm like, all right, here we go. <laughs> <laughs> you know, what's so interesting. So, that I, we barely saw him without that stuff on because, you know, we just see him in passing. It's not like we would hang out all the time or he'd be taking his makeup off, but I never really saw him without the makeup fully on that tour. And then after the tour, I saw him in Hollywood and he was like, Hey, and I didn't, I had no, I was like, <laughs> Hey, <laughs> he's all, he's all Doyle. I'm like, Oh shit, dude! No makeup. <laughs> nice. Yeah, good, good, good dudes. Love good those dude. guys. Speaking of good dudes, let's let's talk about Vinnie Paul and the uh, the few times you know the time the times that he would come out to see you and uh, just life of the party that that guy is. Oh, every time, and he ha his entourage. <laughs> <laughs> you know, just just all all good guys, and uh, just want to make you feel like you're part of the family. And I think that that's how. I, I mean, that's just how he was. It's It wasn't an act. It wasn't anything. I mean, everyone in the Pantera uh, circle, that's just how they are. Like, hey, man, you want to have a drink? You're part of the family now. And um, and I think that that, yeah, I think the first time I met him was in 2013, I believe. It was at Mayhem Fest. Um, and then ever since then, just been the nicest guy just so nice and um you know coming to see everyone play and it, it's weird <clears throat> our sound guy um he texted us right before the last show that we saw him at and he's like no pressure guys Vinnie Paul's here <laughs> <laughs> you know just you know it, he's he, just his attitude his creativity everything about him just 
a huge inspiration, huge loss yeah. to our community. Yeah. I mean, I've, I've said the story a few times on the podcast. The last time I saw him, um, Chris Kale and I went to see Hell Yeah out together. And, and so I go hang out. And, and at that point, I'm friends with Chris. So I'm friends with everybody, you know, because Chris is, is life of the party, too. And, you know, Vinny is just holding court. You know, we're, me and a, a circle of dudes are just standing there listening to Vinny Paul stories, you know. And, yeah. And, and like I said, he had just played um, Rock on the Range. So that was the first time he played in Columbus since the, since the you know, the, the murder of Dime. And he was just telling us all the story of that. And I remember I was like, man, I wish I had a recorder because, the, you know, the podcaster media guy and me comes out. And I was like, these stories are gold. And they're they're just they're just there for us, though. Yeah. I, and, and there's something to be said about that, too, when it's a personal conversation and one on one and you're getting all the stories. Yeah. It's kind of like it's like it's, it's like sacred a little bit, right. <laughs> you know, those those moments you you'll never forget. And that's, that's beautiful. You know, he, and that's how he was. He treated everyone like family. You come in, you hang out your family. <laughs> yeah. He's such a, such a cool dude. And, uh, and you know, I got to, I got to see Pantera a few times as a kid, meet him as a kid, and then obviously kind of talk to him as, as an adult. And uh, yeah, so it's so definitely awesome to, to be able to say that just for me in my little, uh, in my little world. When was the first time you saw them? Uh, first time I saw Pantera was the uh, Far Beyond Driven tour in '94. Damn, I was, I was 14, and my friend and I, um, we went downtown Nashville, searched all the hotels, finally found what hotel, hotel they were staying at. We we like staked out the lobby for like hours, and then we <laughs> then we finally saw Big Val, and this is you know video home videos are out. We saw Big Val you know, we're, we're a bunch of dumb teenagers run up to him. Like, where are they? At? you know, and he's like, if you guys are cool, they'll be cool and blah, blah, blah. So we sat and talked to Val for a little bit. And then, um, I ran to the bathroom and I came in, my friend came running in. He's like, they're checking out. And, uh, <laughs> so I walk out and all I see is the big pink beard. And, and so I have these like terrible pictures of me when I'm 14, like making metal fingers with, with dime and Vinny on each side. It's pretty awesome. That is amazing. Yeah. That is so cool. And, and, you know, to be 14 and, and meet your idols like that, how incredible. And them being cool, that's right. got to be a, a giant, like, <sighs> I did it. <laughs> right. And then actually, if, every time they came through Nashville, you know, we would find the, you know, we would find the bus and we would stake it out. And so I got to, I got to meet them a handful of times. And then I got to meet Dime. Uh, Damage Plan played here a couple of months before his murder and I, and I almost didn't go and I went. And then uh, as I was walking out, dime was signing autographs. So I went over, talked to him again and then kind of got to tell him like a, I met you when I was 14. Now I'm 24. And by that time I had been in a band called primer 55. We had toured and we'd done all this stuff. And, and I, and for some reason I just unloaded all that onto him that day as like a thank you. And then he was taken from us. So it was, it was very nice to be able to do that. That's um, you know, incredible. After years. Yeah, it was, it was pretty awesome. That's like not many people have that story. Right. That's really cool. And the fact that he w was attentive and listening to that oh, is awesome. also incredible. Was like, that's awesome, man. You know, doing all his dime stuff. But yeah. Yeah. That, wow. Yeah. yeah. Pantera. I mean, think about it this way. Like, had Pantera not happened, right. where would metal be today? <laughs> <laughs> it would it definitely not the same by any means. And the fact that uh, they've kept the spirit alive with you know Dime Bash and Right for Dime and all those things is is really cool. And I've been so incredibly lucky to be a part of it for, I mean, several times. And yeah. um, you know, they have all these jams in LA, like they, they did. Um, and, you know, being able to get up and sing these songs that, you know, were written by these fucking geniuses and um, who were probably not in their right mind writing them, <laughs> you know, but, uh, but, you know, it's, it's an incredible legacy. And the fact that you were able to see them live several times and meet them is, is awesome. I'm, I'm, you know, I'm truly jealous of that. Uh, but the fact that we are all blessed with the music, it's pretty cool. And it's, you know, I feel like Pantera was one of the 
one of the first that kind of brought the mainstream in a little bit too. Yeah. I mean, technically the, if, if you don't count the Skid Row album, they're the no, first number one, you know, heavy metal band, you know, with far beyond driven uh, number one on billboard and all that stuff. And I definitely, uh, uh, you know, one of those record sales was from me. So. Yeah. And you know, what's, what I love about them too is they didn't start out at all. Like what they ended up being like, you right. know, the diamond Daryl, <laughs> yeah. um, you know, like the whole hair metal thing. It just shows that there can be evolution and there can be change and it can be great, you know, with a band. And um, they were, you know, they were great in all that they did. Yeah, I, I think that, that that early stuff, even though it's silly, you know, it's like all of us had early bands that were silly, you know. I mean, my band was silly. <laughs> <laughs> and 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 so that they, they but they, they, they learn how to write glammy type songs that, you know, learning from Dokken and Def Leppard and all those bands about how to write a good heavy but catchy song and i think that they even though they they switched into heavier stuff i think they still kept that kind of sensibility about them to be able to write like a verse chorus verse chorus bridge out kind of song you know yeah yeah i mean the fundamentals were still there but i mean yeah uh i <laughs> the way my band started i'm like <laughs> uh see guys it shows growth and evolution and you grew up a little bit <laughs> <laughs> Uh, one, one more thing that kind of ties you to the, the Pantera campus is, is this recently you did the 99 bottles of beer thing. Yes. Uh, Phil is a part of. So, so tell us a little bit about that. That was so cool. and So fun. Um, I was number 72 and I never really get to do like my guttural stuff in the band. Cause Carla, that's what Carla does in our band. And I, so I got to pull it out for this one and just get super fucking brutal with it. Um, and then I, and I knew Phil was going to be on it. I knew that there were going to, there were several people that were confirmed for it, but when it came out, I actually listened to all 99 of them because <laughs> each one was so cool. Um, and then Phil's was exactly like you, you would expect. <laughs> Not one bottle of barrel wall. <laughs> um, it was, but that was really cool and really fun. I was super honored that they thought of me to be a part of it. Um, and i um, among so many greats and and people who aren't even vocalists. It was kind of cool. <laughs> yeah. I mean, that, that was cool. You've done that. You know, Carla's done a lot of the stuff with, with Charlie, with all the, the live of the, you know, collaborations and things yeah. like that. And and I think that the one thing 2020 is going to show us is, is that things can be done in different ways and in collaborations and, and just all this stuff, even doing the show this way now is a product of, not being able to go see you at a festival or see you at a show and sit down and say, Hey, Heidi, let's talk about Pantera. You know, you've, you've yeah. got to find a way to do it. So I think, I think everyone's creativity kind of came out in 2020 to get creative on how to do things in this, uh, in this virtual world that we now live in. Oh yeah. I mean, think about zoom. <laughs> I had Christmas with my family via zoom. <laughs> like usually it'd be on a crappy FaceTime, you know, and, and yeah. but uh, and even this, like being able to see you like beforehand, it was, we just did this on the phone right. and that was cool, but this is cool. You know, being able to actually see facial expressions and I'm a very expressive person with my hands and face oh, yeah. and everything. So my hands, it's crazy. <laughs> Sometimes when I watch these things back, I'm like, God, someone needs to tape my hands to my legs. <laughs> <laughs> But no, it's it's definitely fun. Yeah, the first time I ever saw a, a, a interview back that I did, I'm just like, hey, so like you know when you talk about, <laughs> yeah, <laughs> you don't realize it until you see it. It's it's pretty nuts. <laughs> We're just very expressive people. There we go. <laughs> um, as we kind of wrap up here, what's your what's your go to Pantera record? Vulgar display, man. <laughs> Yeah, it's got to be. I mean, it's monumental, really. Um, that's, that's, I mean, all of them are great. <laughs> but yeah, probably that one. You know, one story that I was really um, inspired by, just kind of like wrapping it up a little bit there. One One story that I was really inspired by is that the hustle that Pantera had before they broke, um, you know, they would just make the tapes and sell them out of their truck. 
you know, and try and just hear everyone. You got to hear this. You got to hear this. You got to hear this. And, um, you know, that hustle, it's, it's, I guess, I guess it's just not really like, it's not like that anymore. <laughs> and I think that that kind of hustle is really cool. And that's something I, I always thought about with them is just the depths that they would go to for their success. I thought that was really cool. Yeah. I mean, there was definitely a time, even, even in my early bands in the mid nineties, you know, like I was trying to do, you would go out on every, every show and fly or hand out handbills to everybody. Mm -hmm. And now I wonder, you know, if you're in a band, you're just like, well, here's a Facebook post and I'm done for the day. You know, like, (laughs) you you know, you wonder how many people are out there still. I, I still think that the, you know, interaction, the human interaction with people is still, is still something you need to do to, to get your band across and things totally. like that. When we first started, we had a residency at the Roxy and uh, we would go up and down Sunset Boulevard and hand out flyers or give out free tickets and stuff. And that was like, I think that that's how initially we got people to come to our shows initially. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. It's just got to be, I wonder how many bands, you know, do all this stuff, you know, and, and even, even a Pantera, you know, they were together for what, eight years before the, the first major label album, you know, comes out and they're building and building and building to this thing. And I think a lot of bands now get together and if they don't have success in six months, you know, they're like, ah, fuck it. <laughs> you know? Oh, absolutely. The hustle, you know, <laughs> it's just so easy, I guess now for bands to, make a post on Facebook and think that that's going to break them or make a song and think that that's going to break them. Um, play a couple shows locally and think that's going to break them. Um, clearly it's not like that, but, <laughs> uh, I, I, there's something to be said about that hustle for sure. Well, you never know what's going to break you. You know, it could be a fucking hostile, you know, cover <laughs> a <laughs> shitty a shitty video that goes viral <laughs> yeah, you, never know. you never know yeah i know i guess i guess i'm i'm <laughs> just like them <laughs> <laughs> all right and uh and well as we talked about at the beginning we talked a little bit about what's going on in, in the butcher babies camp but you know as as we wrap up here you know 2021 have you heard are we going to get shows in 2021 or, or what's going on here i mean i'm booked on a ton of shows for 2021 so i hope so um Oh, yeah. I mean, I know a lot of bands had rescheduled for, you know, this month and had to postpone those again. Um, Everyone's hopeful, but you just, I, uh, every day is a different story. Um, There's tours that we are tentatively booked on that could be, could happen or not. Um, Stuff in Europe, it's just... Bingo. Come on, live music. Let's do this. <laughs> All right. And then uh, final question. What's your go-to Pantera song? Oh, fucking hostile. Here we go. <laughs> <laughs> of course. It's what uh, I wouldn't be here if fucking hostile hadn't happened. Right. right. So. <laughs> well, Heidi Shepard, thank you so much for taking the time today. Thanks for dragging the waters with me. And no, uh, thank you. A Pantera today. Yes. Yes. Thank you so much. And uh, hey, Rock on.